Chapter 4 For a few months, Peta and I take in the scene of our mentor trying to rise out of the slippery, vile stuff from his stomach. The reek of vomit and raw spirits almost brings my dinner up. We exchange a glance. Obviously, Hamish isn't much, but Effie Trinket is right about one thing. Once we're in the arena, he's all we've got. As if by some unspoken agreement, Peta and I each take one of Hamish's arms and help him to his feet. I tripped? Hamish asks. Smells bad. He wipes his hand on his nose, smearing his face with vomit. Let's get you back to your room, says Peta, clean you up a bit. We half lead, half carry Hamish back to his compartment. Since we can't exactly set him down on the embroidered bedspread, we haul him into the bathtub and turn the shower on him. He hardly notices. It's okay, Peta says to me, I'll take it from here. I can't help feeling a little grateful since the last thing I want to do is trip down Haymitch, wash the vomit off of, out of his chest hair, and tuck him into bed. Possibly Peta is trying to make a good impression on him to be his favorite once the games begin, but judging by the state he's in, Haymitch will have no memory of this tomorrow. All right, I say, I can send one of the capital people to help you. There's any number on the train. Cooking for us, waiting on us, guarding us, taking care of us is their job. No, I don't want them, says Peta. I nod and head to my own room. I understand how Peta feels. I can't stand the sight of the capital people myself. But making them deal with Hamish might be a small form of revenge. So I'm pondering the reason why he insists on taking care of Hamish, and all of a sudden I think, it's because he's being kind. Just as he was kind to give me the bread. The idea pulls me up short. A kind Peta Malark is far more dangerous to me than an unkind one. Kind people have a way of working their way inside me and rooting there. And I can't let Peta do this. Not where we're going. So I decide, from this moment on, to have as little as possible to do with the baker's son. When I get, to my, when I get back to my room, the train is pausing at a platform to refuel. I quickly open the window... Toss the cookies Peter's father gave me out of the train and slam them shut. No more. No more of either of them. Unfortunately, the packet of cookies hits the ground and bursts open in a patch of dandelions by the track. I only see the image for a moment because the train is off again, but it's enough. Enough to remind me of that other dandelion in the schoolyard years ago. I had just turned away from Peter Malark's bruised face when I saw the dandelion and I knew hope wasn't lost. I plucked it carefully and headed home. I grabbed a bucket and Prim's hand and headed to the meadow. And yes, it was dotted with those golden-headed weeds. After we'd harvested those, we scrounged along inside the fence for probably a mile until we'd filled the bucket with the dandelion greens, stems, and flowers. That night, we gorged ourselves on dandelion salad and the rest of the bakery bread. What else? Prim asked me. What other food can we find? All kinds of things, I promised her. I just have to remember them. My mother had a book she'd brought with her from the apothecary shop. The pages were made of old parchment and covered in ink drawings of plants. Neat handwritten blocks told their names, where to gather them, when they came in bloom, their medical uses. But my father added other entries to the book. Plants for eating, not healing. Dandelions, pokeweed, wild onions, pines. Prim and I spent the rest of the night poring over those pages. The next day, we were off school. For a while, I hung around the edges of the meadow, but finally I worked up the courage to go under the fence. It was the first time I'd been there alone, without my father's weapons to protect me. But I retrieved the small bow and arrows he'd made me from a hollow tree. I probably didn't go more than 20 yards into the woods that day. Most of the time, I perched up in the branches of an old oak, hoping for game to come by. After several hours, I had the good luck to kill a rabbit. I'd shot a few rabbits before but my, with my father's guidance, but this I'd done on my own. We hadn't had meat in months. The sight of the rabbit seemed to stir something in my mother. She roused herself, skinned the carcass, and made a stew with the meat and some more greens Prim had gathered. Then she acted confused and went back to bed, but when the stew was done, we made her eat a bowl. The, wood became, the woods became our savior, and each day I went a bit farther into its arms. It was a slow going at first, but I was determined to feed us. I stole eggs from nests, 
caught fish in nets, sometimes managed to shoot a squirrel or rabbit for stew, and gathered the various plants that sprung up beneath my feet. Plants are tricky. Many are edible, but one false mouthful and you're dead. I checked and double-checked the plants I harvested with my father's pictures. I kept this alive. Any sign of danger, a distant howl, the inexplicable break of a branch, set me flying back to the fence at first. Then I began to risk climbing trees to escape the wild dogs that quickly got bored and moved on. Bears and cats lived deeper in, perhaps disliking the sooty reek of our district. On May 8th, I went to the Justice Building, signed up for my tesserae, and pulled home my first batch of grain and oil in Prim's toy wagon. On the 8th of every month, I was entitled to do the same. I couldn't stop hunting and gathering, of course. The grain was not enough to live on, and there were other things to buy, soap and milk and thread. What we didn't absolutely have to eat, I began to trade at the hob. I was frightened. It was frightening to enter that place without my father at my side, but people had respected him, and they accepted me. Game was game, after all, no matter who shot it. I also sold at the back doors of the wealthier clients in town, trying to remember what my father had told me, and learning a few new tricks as well. The butcher would buy my rabbits, but not squirrels. The baker enjoyed squirrel, but would only trade for one if his wife wasn't around. The head peacekeeper loved wild turkey. The mayor had a passion for strawberries. In the late summer, in late summer, I was washing up in a pond when I noticed the plants growing around me. Tall with leaves like arrowheads, blossoms with three wide petals. I knelt down in the water, my fingers digging into the soft mud, and pulled up handfuls of the roots, small bluish tubers that, did, that don't look like much, but boiled or baked are as good as any potato. Katniss, I said aloud, it's the plant I was named for. And I heard my father's voice joking, as long as you can find yourself, you'll never starve. Ooh, that's a key term, isn't it? Because that's essentially what she did. I spent hours stirring up the pond bed with my toes and a stick, gathering the tubers that floated to the top. That night, we feasted on fish and Katniss roots until we were all, for the first time in months, full. Slowly, my mother returned to us. She began to clean and cook and preserve some of the food I brought in for winter. People traded us or paid money for her medical remedies. One day, I heard her singing. Prim was thrilled to have her back, but I kept watching, waiting for her to disappear on us again. I didn't trust her, and some small, gnarled place inside me hated her for her weakness, for her neglect, for the months she had put us through. Prim forgave her, but I had taken a step back from my mother, put up a wall to protect myself from needing her, and nothing was ever the same between us again. Now, I was going to die without that ever being set right. I thought of how I had yelled at her today in the Justice Building. I had told her I loved her, too, though, so maybe it would all balance out. For a while, I stand staring out the train window, wishing I could open it again, but unsure of what would happen at such high speed. In the distance, I see the lights of another district. Seven? Ten? I don't know. I think, for, I think about the people in their homes settling in for bed. I imagine my home with its shutters drawn tight. What are they doing now? My mother and Prim. Were they able to eat supper? The fish stew and the strawberries? Or did it lay untouched on their plates? Did they watch the recap of the day's events on the battered old TV that sits on the table against the wall? Surely there were more tears. Is my mother holding up, being strong for Prim? Or has she already started to slip away, leaving the weight of the world on my sister's fragile so shoulders? Prim will undoubtedly sleep with my mother tonight. The thought of that scruffy old buttercup posting himself on the bed to watch over Prim comforts me. If she cries, he will nose his way into her arms and curl up there until she calms down and falls asleep. I'm so glad I didn't drown him. Imagine, imagining my home makes me ache with loneliness. This day could have been endless. Could Gail and I have been eating blackberries only this morning? It seems like a lifetime ago, like a long dream that deteriorated into a nightmare. 
Maybe, if I go to sleep, I will wake up back in District 12 where I belong. Probably the drawers hold any number of nightgowns, but I just strip off my shirt and pants and climb into the bed in my underwear. The sheets are made of soft, silky fabric. A thick, fluffy comforter gives immediate warmth. If I'm going to cry, now is the time to do it. By morning, I'll be able to wash the damage done by, my, by the tears from my face. But no tears come. I'm too tired or too numb to cry. The only thing I feel is a desire to be somewhere else. So I let the train rock me into oblivion. Stop and think about what Katniss is experiencing right now. And remember, you're hearing the story from her perspective. So the way she's thinking about people might not be how people actually are. Because, you know, sometimes you think certain ways about people, but then they do something to prove you wrong. So whenever you're dealing with a book in first-person perspective like this one, be very careful that you don't mix up what she's thinking with what's actually happening. And that seems to be a core, uh, you know, a core sort of element of this book where things are happening to her and then they're appearing on screen. So, continuing. Gray light is leaking through the curtains when the rapping rouses me. I hear Effie Trinket's voice calling me to rise. Up, up, up! It's going to be a big, big, big day! I try and imagine for a moment what it must be like inside that woman's head. What thoughts fill her waking hours? What dreams come to her at night? I have no idea. I put the green outfit back on since it's not really dirty, just lightly crumpled from spending the night on the floor. My fingers trace the circle around the little gold mocking jay, and I think of the woods, and of my father, and of my mother, and Prim waking up, having to get on with things. I slept in the elaborate braided hair my mother did for the reaping, and it doesn't look too bad, so I just leave it up. It doesn't matter. We can't be far from the capital now. And once we reach the city, my stylist will dictate my look for the opening ceremonies tonight anyway. I just hope I get I just hope I get one who doesn't think nudity is the last word in fashion. As I enter the dining car, Effie Trinket brushes by me with a cup of black coffee. She's muttering obscenities under her breath. Hamish, his face puffy and red from the previous day's indulgences, is chuckling. Peter holds a roll and looks somewhat embarrassed. Sit down, sit down, says Hamish, waving me over. The moment I slide into my chair, I'm served an enormous platter of food. Eggs, ham, piles of fried potatoes, a tureen of fruit sits on, on, in ice to keep it chilled. The basket of rolls they set before me would keep my family going for a week. There's an elegant glass of orange juice. At least I think it's orange juice. I've only ever tasted an orange once at New Year's when my father bought one as a special treat. A cup of coffee. My mother adores coffee, which we could almost never afford, but it only tastes bitter and thin to me. A rich brown cup of something I've never seen. They call it hot chocolate, says Peta. It's good. I take a sip of the hot, sweet, creamy li liquid and a shudder runs through me. Even though the rest of the meal beckons, I ignore it until I've drained my cup. Then I stuff down every mouthful I can hold, which is a substantial amount, being careful to not overdo it on the richest stuff. One time my mother told me that I always eat like I'll never see food again. And I said, I won't unless I bring it home. That shut her up. Okay. <laughs> These people have never had hot chocolate before. Can you imagine that? Like, there are people who are clearly rich enough to afford all this food in their country. But they have never had it because they live in District 12. This feels so unfair to me. When my stomach feels like it's about to split open, I lean back and take in my breakfast companions. Pita is still eating, breaking off bits of roll and dipping them in hot chocolate. Hamish hasn't paid much attention to his platter, but he's knocking back a glass of red juice that he keeps thinning with a clear liquid from a bottle. Judging by the fumes, it's some kind of spirit. I don't know Hamish, but I've seen him in often enough in the hob, tossing handfuls of money on the counter of the woman who sells white liquor. He'll be incoherent by the time we reach the capital. I realize I detest Hamish. No wonder the District 12 distributes never stand a chance. It isn't just that we've been underfed and lack training. 
Some of our tributes have still been strong enough to make a go, for it, go of it, but we rarely get sponsors, and he's a big part of the reason why. The rich people who back tributes, either because they're betting on them or simply for the bragging rights of picking a winner, expect someone classier than Hamish to deal with. So, you're supposed to give us advice, I say to Hamish. Here's some advice. Stay alive, says Hamish, and then bursts out laughing. I exchange a look with Peta before I remember I'm having nothing more to do with him. I'm surprised to see the hardness in his eyes. He generally seems so mild. That's very funny, says Peta. Suddenly he lashes out at the glass in Hamish's hand. It shatters on the floor, sending the blood-red liquid running toward the back of the train. Only not to us. Hamish considers this a moment, and then punches Peta in the jaw, knocking him from his chair. When he turns back to reach for the spirits, I drive my knife into the table between his hand and the bottle, barely missing his fingers. I brace myself to deflect his hit, but it doesn't come. Instead, he sits back and squints at us. Well, what's this? says Hamish. Did I actually get a pair of fighters this year? I'm sorry, did you just punch a 16-year-old? Buddy! Peter rises from the floor and scoops up a handful of ice from under the fruit tureen. He starts to raise it to the red mark on his jaw. No, says Hamish, stopping him. Let the bruise show. The audience will think you've mixed it up with another tribute before you've even made it to the arena. That's against the rules, says Peter. Only if they catch you. That bruise will say you fought. You weren't caught even better, says Hamish. He turns to me. Can you hit anything with that knife beside the table? The bow and arrow is my weapon, but I've spent a fair amount of time throwing knives as well. Sometimes, if I've wounded an animal with an arrow, it's better to get a knife into it too before I approach it. I realize that if I want Hamish's attention, this is my moment to make an impression. I yank the knife out of the table, get a grip on the blade, and then throw it into the wall across the room. I was actually just hoping to get a good solid stick, but it launches in the seam between two panels, making me look a lot better than I am. Wow. Stand over here, both of you, says Hamish, nodding to the middle of the room. We obey and he circles us, prodding us like animals at times, checking our muscles, examining our faces. Well, you're not entirely hopeless. Seem fit. And once the stylists get hold of you, you'll be attractive enough. Peta and I don't question this. The Hunger Games aren't a beauty contest, but the best-looking tributes always seem to pull more, more sponsors. All right, I'll make a deal with you. You don't interfere with my drinking, and I'll stay sober enough to help you. But you have to do exactly what I say. It's not much of a deal, but still a giant step forward from ten minutes ago when we had no guide at all. Fine, says Peta. So help us, I say. When we get to the arena, what's our best strategy at the cornucopia for someone? One thing at a time. In a few minutes, we'll be pulling into the station. You'll be put into the hands of your stylists. You're not going to like what they do to you, but no matter what it is, don't resist, says Hamish. But, I begin, no buts. Don't resist, says Hamish. He takes a bottle of spirits from the table and leaves the car. As the door swings shuts behind him, the car goes dark. There are still a few lights inside, but outside it's as if the night as if night has fallen. I realize we must be in a tunnel that runs up through the mountains into the capital. The mountains form a natural barrier between the capital and the eastern districts. It is almost impossible to enter from the east except through major except through the tunnels. This geographical advantage was a major factor in the districts losing the war that led to my being tribute today. Since the rebels had to scale the mountains, they were easy targets for the capital's air forces. Wow. Okay. Peter Malark and I stand in silence as the train speeds along. The tunnel goes on and on, and I think of the tons of rocks separating me from the sky, and my chest tightens. I hate being encased in stone this way. It reminds me of the mines and my father, trapped, unable to reach sunlight, buried forever in the darkness. The train finally begins to slow, and suddenly bright lights flood the compartment. We can't help it. Both Peta and I run to the window to see what we've only seen on television. The capital, 
the ruling city of Panem. The cameras haven't lied about its grandeur. If anything, they have not captured the magnificence of the glistening buildings in a rainbow of hues that tower into the air, the shiny cars that roll down the wide paved streets, the oddly dressed people with bizarre hair and painted faces who have never missed a meal. All the colors seem artificial. The pinks too deep, the greens too bright, the yellows painful to the eyes, like the flat round discs of hard candy we can never afford to buy at the tiny sweet shop in District 12. So it's making a weird contrast between the colorful capital and the very gray District 12. Think about how setting plays into what a place appears to be. The people begin to point at us eagerly as they recognize a tribute train rolling into the city. I step away from the window, sickened by their excitement, knowing they can't wait to watch us die. But Peter holds his ground, actually waving and smiling at the gawking crowd. He only stops when the train pulls into the station, blocking us from their view. He sees me staring at him and shrugs. Who knows, he says, one of them may be rich. I have misjudged him. I think of his actions since the reaping began, the friendly squeeze of my hand. His father showing up with the cookies and promising to feed Prim. Did Peta put him up to that? His tears at the station, volunteering to wash Hamish, but then challenging him this morning when apparently the nice guy approach had failed. And now the waving at the window, already trying to win the crowd. All of the pieces are still fitting together, but I sense... He has a plan forming. He hasn't accepted his death. He is already fighting hard to stay alive. Which also means that kind Peter Malark, the boy who gave me the bread, is fighting hard to kill me. Oh, wow. I would suggest you reread this chapter on your own just to make all the connections because there's a lot of them. 